My research is on computer security, so I'm going to talk today about some applications of uh, information theory in encryption. So let's say that I build some sort of fancy uh, encryption scheme. Um, I'm sure that you've seen the notation for encryption. Uh, so can you give me a secret message? Oh gosh, 42. 42. <laughs> it's 42. always 42. <laughs> So in computer file, it's been covered how we can write down encryption. So let's encrypt your number 42 with some key, some secret key that only you and I know. Uh, so let's agree on the number 20 as the key. And what this gives you is some big random looking string. Now I'm going to make some modification here. Um, I'm going to translate this and say we take the number 20 and we put it in front of, so we compose it in front of whatever the text is that you're sending me. So, so like app it. append the text to it or something like that? Append it in front, that's exactly right. Concatenate the number 42. So that means that this would become, it happens to be a number again, uh, the number 2042. But of course you could do this with text instead of numbers as well. A concatenation, you just put it in front, right? Now, why do we do this? Well, the reason we're doing this is because I want my encryption to have a special property, which is that I want to be able to kind of verify that I'm uh, decrypting the right thing and not accidentally decrypting something else. Because this number here corresponds to a large random looking cipher text. And so does this number. They all correspond to different random looking cipher texts, uh, but I can decrypt it with any key I want and I will get some outcome. But I want to be able to verify my outcome and see that I did the thing I wanted to do. So in this case, when you encrypt uh, 20 followed by 43, uh, 42, I can decrypt it uh, with the key 20 and I get the number 2042 out and I can verify that the first two characters are my key and I'm happy with that. I take them off and I keep the remainder. If the decryption had some other things in front of it, I wouldn't have been happy and I would have said, okay, I've made a mistake here. So this is a form of encryption where you can verify that you've decrypted correctly and that it's not nonsense. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because this shows you a weakness of information theory, because I want to describe this bit string here, random looking bit string, as having high entropy, right? That's what it feels like. It should have a high entropy. That's what it means to be random looking. But actually it's not random at all, right? Because if I look at the decryption key 19 and I apply it to that random looking bit string, I'm getting a ciphertext that will almost certainly not start with 19. If I'm decrypting it with 21 or the letter A or you know whatever you can come up with, the odds are it's not going to start with the right key, uh, which means that it's not a valid decryption, which means that it's not in our set of possible decryptions. So there's only going to be potentially one key that actually works. In other words, there's only one combination of key and ciphertext that actually corresponds to this. So that means that the entropy of this string is zero bits. There's only one possible string. So applying information theory here says there's only one thing it could mean, but that doesn't mean that you know what it means. And that's the interesting thing about information theory, right? It tells you there's only one thing it can mean, but it doesn't tell you what that thing is. And the whole trick of encryption is, of this sort of encryption, symmetric encryption, is not that there is multiple combinations that they could be, but rather that it's really, really, really difficult to find the combination. Now in the case of 20 and 42, it's maybe not that difficult, but if you use proper keys and, uh, and, and messages that are properly padded, then it's going to be insanely difficult to find the right combination. So it's not relying on there being multiple combinations, but rather there's only one, but it's increasingly difficult to find. But that raises a natural question. Can we not have multiple combinations? Can we not rely on this? And the answer is actually, yes, we can. So this is the uh, idea behind a one-time pad. And what that is, is you have some binary message. Uh, so 42, uh, for example, is uh, 32. 
plus 8, no 16, plus no 4, plus a 2, and no 1. So I believe the binary representation of 42 is 101010. And we then come up with a random binary pad. So let's say 000101. And we XOR these values meaning if we have a 1 and a 0, we get a 1. If we get a 0 and a 0, we get a 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. If the values are the same, you get a 0. If the values are different, you get a 1. That's an XOR. So you do that with your pad and you end up with a binary string. As long as we both know the same pad, we both get the same string. Now the idea here is that any pad is possible. So at, for every string you get as output, there are, because this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 bits, exactly uh, 64 possible combinations. In other words, there are 6 bits of entropy. So the one-time pad does not rely on your problem being computationally hard. In fact, your, combina uh, your problem is computationally super simple. It doesn't get easier than taking an XOR of, of two strings. It really doesn't get much easier than that. But it relies on there being uh, 64 combinations that we could have done it with. Uh, which means that if I'm giving you this string and you don't know the pad, there are exactly 64 pairs of pads and messages that are in the set of possibilities. And every message is represented exactly once for each pair. So that means that every message is equally probable, meaning you don't learn anything about your message. So this is known as information theoretic security. Now the downside is that you're not actually gaining anything in terms of security. Because we had to have a secret ahead of time that was 6 bits, so 64 combinations. Um, and afterwards, we still have a secret of exactly that size. And I'm not able to reuse this secret ever again. Because once I do, we're not gaining any entropy. So we're stuck, right? So we have to have some magic way uh, to exchange randomness. And this, by the way, is what's being proposed in some uh, quantum cryptography schemes where you're communicating by sharing a source of, of randomness. So that's all very interesting, um, but that's a different type of cryptography as the ones that you will typically find in your computer. So if, I get, if I'm going to work you know, every day for the rest of my life and I have these, these choices, um, then actually having the expected, so the average cost kind of makes sense because I get to make this, I get to execute the policy. Time step and we add, based on our schedule, that amount of noise, right? So we have...